Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupommier. And today we're going to be discussing musculoskeletal and neuropathic pain. Oof. It's quite a, quite a broad topic. It certainly is. I, uh, I something a, that we've all had, I presume. Also. Was, that, was that a sigh? Exas what was that noise? A little were, bit. Were you, in, were you in pain? Well, you know, I've, in, my youth, <laughs> in my youth, I was involved in athletics. Uh -huh. And I've had my share of lumps and bumps like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But I've never had chronic long-term skeletal muscular pain or any neuropathies that I couldn't deal with. But I presume that we're going to discuss those now. You know, I'm glad you sighed um, because this, this is a broad topic. Yeah. Um, and I'll say as broad as fever. This is one of the common complaints where people will come to the clinician and they will present with musculoskeletal pain, and then similar to fever, we're gonna be trying to figure out is this benign musculoskeletal pain, right. which is really what we're gonna end up focusing on eventually, or is this a warning sign of something something more serious? Sure. Something that maybe we'll be covering in one of our other chapters or other lectures. Yep. So just to start off, when we say musculoskeletal pain, what, what, are, what are we talking about? So exactly. I was about to ask that, actually. <laughs> go, go ahead and ask. Uh, Daniel, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Griffin. <laughs> just what is meant by musculoskeletal pain? Yeah, it really, I mean, it's really if you break it apart. It, my dad does this with, like, just think about what, what the Hebrew means. I'm like, I don't know what the Hebrew means. But musculoskeletal, it's pain that is either focused on the muscles, so muscular pain, sure. or pain that's skeletal pain. And, and in a lot of ways that might be joint pain, but it also might be pain coming from a vertebrae or a broken bone or... Yeah. Are we talking about bruises and uh, trauma injuries that could occur throughout the body uh, as a result of an accident or some occupational repetitive motion type of thing that People so so certainly that would fall under this. And a lot of times people will present to the clinician um, with, um, we'll say, osteoarthritis, arthritic pain, uh, where yes. I've been having pain uh, yes. for a long period of time in my joints. Yep. Or they might say, I've been um, involved in a recent fall or an accident, and after that I sure. have this pain. Sure. Um, a lot of the pain is due to repetitive tests. So you have to sit in a certain yeah, way, right. you have to you know, work in the field, you have to be bending over, exactly. and you may be developing pain. So we have our arthritic pain, which yep. may be chronic. Yep. We can have some injury or acute movement um, pain that can be um, related to a fall, an injury, a task. And then, unfortunately, in a lot of these situations, we can have pain that becomes chronic. And then we'll touch a little bit as we move on. In addition to musculoskeletal pain, we're going to be talking about neuropathic pain. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to distinguish musculoskeletal pain, which is treated and considered one way, to neuropathic pain, which is treated True. another way. True. Great. Okay. And I know you asked me before about neuropathic pain, and, and we talked a little bit about... Yeah, um, I, I'm curious as to the relationship, because I know that you can't move without some nervous stimulation to the muscle, which is, of course, attached by a ligament to the bone. So you've got the whole system working uh, the moment you take a step or the moment that you reach for something. So how would you distinguish between neuromuscular, or rather, I'm sorry, not neuromuscular, musculoskeletal pain, and neuropathies, which might be due to a movement of a muscle that's in True, true. And the, the <clears throat> neuropathy is, is broad. It can be a neuropathy can be an issue with a nerve giving you motor. It can be an issue with a nerve giving you sensation. Or as we're talking about, it can be a nerve delivering pain. Right. And one of the very common, unfortunately, growing problems throughout the world is diabetes-associated ah, yes. neuropathic pain. Oh, yes where people have the feet are burning and it's just this uh, really difficult pain to live with. Wow. Um, so, so one of the things that I like to ask people when they first come in, yep. when they say that they have pain, yes. is how, what is the severity of this pain? Okay. And I don't know if you're familiar with some of our severity scoring systems. No, but I have a feeling I'm about to become familiar with them. <laughs> okay. Well, for, for, those, for those of you that are being introduced to the pain scales, um, this will be coming up on the screen now. For those, who, those of you who are watching the videos, but for those of you who are listening to our audio version, um, I'm going to be going through with Dixon here um, about the different pain scales. And one of the 
common pain scales is a, a numeric pain scale okay. where we grade pain from zero, meaning no pain, right. all the way up to 10, which is incapacitating. Mm -hmm. And the grades actually go zero being none, one would be minimal, two mild, three uncomfortable, four moderate, five distracting, six is when you start to be distressed by the pain, seven is when it's starting to become unmanageable. Um, eight is intense, nine is severe, and 10 is when the pain incapacitates you. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, I've uh, lived long enough to have to have visit the hospital with relatives and friends of mine who were incapacitated because of some, some serious illness, and they were on uh, pain medications. And the nurse would come in and ask them how they felt, and they would say, I'm in pain, and they would increase the dosage of whatever they were using as a painkiller, like morphine or something of that sort. And she would then ask, or he would then ask, well, how do you feel now? Mm -hmm. And almost immediately, the pain level drops, of course, when you increase the dose. So, but I've never heard them say, is it from one to 10, how do you feel? Yeah. I, I haven't heard that, and, and you know, I've, I've seen it on TV, of course, but, uh, but you ask that regularly, is that true? You know, it is in um, many ways become the, um, the fifth vital sign. Oh. And it's, um, it was mandated because, um, at least in the United States about 20 years ago, there was an epidemic of under-treating pain. Right. I this was that. then followed by an epidemic of over-treating over pain. <laughs> of course. Um, of course. And, it, and it becomes really challenging to interpret this. Um, we have our numbers, we have our words, and actually for um, the younger individuals or for illiterate individuals, we'll actually have pictures and it's facial expressions. Oh, yeah. um, just, you know, when someone is incapacitated, um, they'll often be red in the face, they'll be crying, they'll be clenching of the teeth. Got it. Someone who is, you know, watching the television, as, yes. you, as you may be getting your medical information that way, <laughs> They might be smiling. They might tell me they have four <laughs> out of ten pain, but yet they really would like me to come back when their show finishes. <laughs> right. Um, so <clears throat> the num, but the numbers can be challenging um, because, sure. as as you mentioned, you, th this is the first time you're being introduced to them. And can you imagine a patient comes to see you as a doctor, and you say, "Oh, what level is your pain right. on a scale of zero to 10? They may throw out a number, and then I often ask, okay, so you, you said seven. When in your life have you had a seven? When have you had more or less? And I try to put that level of pain in context. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a couple anecdotes here. Please do. Um, <laughs> and actually, the anecdote centered around a patient I saw earlier this week, and um, she was in pain, and she told me that her pain was seven out of ten. So I said to the woman that I, um, I once had a patient when I was working out in um, the Veterans Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. And this individual was in the intensive care unit. And I went over and they were focused. They had a little bit of sweat on their upper brow. Their heart rate was increased. They, they looked uncomfortable, to put it mildly. And when I asked them, how much pain are you in? Um, the man continued to look straight ahead and said, it's only about four out of 10, doc. <laughs> and I said, you know, you, you look a bit uncomfortable for a four sure. out of 10 rating. Sure. Have you ever been in this much pain before? Right. And his response was that I was gut shot in battle in Vietnam, and that was not as bad as this. And so his four, wow. as you can imagine, is quite different then maybe he thought the scales were the other way <laughs> one is the worst you can ever have oh no his expression was i could imagine much worse pain oh my goodness. and in his world experience wow. you know the three the four he had seen people go through quite significant right. battlefield trauma right and so the woman who said it was seven out of ten i asked her and she said well when i was in labor it was not as bad as the pain i'm now having my goodness so again her seven which people might use on our scale, say, well, it's getting to the point where I really can't manage. She probably should have been saying an eight or a nine. If the pain was beyond what she experienced in labor, it was probably, so I always say these number systems are great, helpful, right. but you need to put them into context. So the other thing that I guess everybody would be asking at this point then is, 
what brought that patient to your attention? Did so they that, come yeah. in because of the pain or were they also suffering from something else? And as you're interviewing them, they say, oh, by the way, I've got chronic pain or something like that. So, so I think there's, there's two situations where that can happen. Um, often they come in for something else and as you're going through the list, and by the way, yes. in addition to why I came in, this back pain is just getting unmanageable. Right. And can right. we talk about that right. too? Right. Um, it's actually one of the common complaints as presenting. It's one of the most common reasons they come to see yeah. um, the clinician. And so let's talk. We, we've gotten a sense of severity. Yep. And now we're going to talk a little bit about um, understanding the pain. Okay. And so I think what you brought up was nice is one of the next questions we ask once we have severity is, tell me a little more about the pain. <laughs> Where does it hurt? <laughs> so that's, that's perfect. Where is one of the most important guiding uh, yeah. bits of information? I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, is the pain in your toe? Right. Is the pain in your back? Right. Is the pain in your head? Yeah. They may eventually lead us into a, into a, a headache differential. They may lead us into some other differential based upon the localization. So that's one of the first things in the diagnosis is severity. Second thing might be localization. And then like so many things in medicine, we might ask, when did it start? Duration? Sure. Is there anything you can think of that may have happened before yeah, the pain yeah, that may yeah, have yeah. brought this on? Anything you do to make it better? Um, this reminds me of when I was graduating medical school, Eli Weisel, who wrote the book Night, gave us a bit of a graduation speech, which I remember to this day. Wow. And uh, he said, as much as you think you know, the patients may know more. So always ask them. Absolutely. So really critical in musculoskeletal and neuropathic pain, which we may see as benign most of the time, is taking the time to listen to get all this information. Sure. How severe is it? That's right. When did it start? Yeah. What makes it better? What makes it worse? Um, and then any associated symptoms. Yeah. If someone has back pain and fever, if someone has back pain yeah. and weakness in the limb, if someone has back pain and problems with inability to urinate. So you're, you're starting as you're going through this to try to make a distinction between sure. benign pain yep. that we're going to address symptomatically much like fever and more serious pain that will take us down different algorithms. Great. Um, so the, the diagnosis, um, in addition to symptoms, then we'll move on to signs. Someone who has what you feel is benign, potentially benign musculoskeletal exam, I always recommend that everyone gets a complete physical examination um, because you do not want to miss something serious. It's true. And unless you get in a, say a routine yep. of being thorough, this is where you're going to miss something. Yeah. And that'll be embarrassing for you <laughs> and potentially devastating for the patient. So do you actually ask them to get up and walk around so you can see whether or not they're avoiding pain by altering the way they move? I, I like to say my physical exam starts before they come into the exam room and I am I'm watching them walk in. Okay. I'm watching how they sit okay. down. I'm also watching how they get up. Do they need to use the arms to push themselves up? Are they able to just stand up? Eggs. Do they sit down Eggs. gingerly? Right. Um, so the, right. the whole exam starts before I might bring them over with my stethoscope and my tools of the trade. Right. Um, no, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, you also, when you're looking and focusing on a particular, you might look for any degree of deformity. Um, I'm always amazed that people are willing to tolerate quite a bit of um, I, and then there are some diseases, and I know them because I used to teach some of them, not all of them, mm -hmm. where there's no pain at all, but you take a look and you say, you mean to tell me that that doesn't hurt? And so that's the opposite of what we're talking about, but it's pretty important to, to bring that in. I think I'm thinking of diseases like leprosy or mm -hmm. elephantiasis or something of that nature, or, or leishmaniasis even where the lesions are fulminating and they look violaceous and they look infected, and they are, of course, but it doesn't result in pain. So how does that work? Yeah. And is that an organism characteristic or is that a defense mechanism to keep 
the body working so that you can drink and eat and walk and <laughs> that sort of thing. Well, I would say <clears throat> that's an interesting issue. Um, and I like the fact that you bring up leishmaniasis and leprosy. Certain diseases, what is striking is the absence of pain. Exactly. So a person will have an area where they notice, I can't feel. And the inability to feel in a certain patch might be as disturbing as, as What the is pain. that called clinically when you find an area that doesn't respond? To anesthesia. Aha. Anesthesia. So in addition, to, um, in addition to pain, as you brought up, lack of the ability to sense something can be an issue. Right. Um, we'll just review our warning signs. So the warning signs that make you say this might not be nine are associated symptoms such as fever, yep. um, weight loss. Right. Um, impacts on bowel and bladder function, the ability to urinate, um, associated um, sensory loss. Um, and now that we've, and, and we're gonna have to spend a little time on treatment here, and I say a little, not a lot. Once we've ruled out something more serious, yeah. and we wanna provide symptomatic therapy, mm. um, much like fever, I wanna make a point of, we don't wanna jump straight to pharmaceuticals. Because a lot of these areas you go in, if someone comes in and they say, I work in the fields, my back is always killing me. Right. What are you gonna give them? A week of medicines, two weeks of medicines? A paid vacation. Yeah, a paid vacation. <laughs> I want you to stop working and feeding your family. Yeah, exactly um, right. So interesting enough, one of the wonderful experiences I had once on a trip down um, in Central America is I was with a physical therapist. And this individual would be teaching the different individuals exercises, uh, ways of uh, lifting, um, the posturally appropriate way. So first thing I guess I will say is always focus on what's precipitating it when possible. And these are inexpensive interventions, um, exercises, stretches, non-pharmacological therapy, and a big thing I will say, fluid intake. In many parts of the world, people wow. are not um, getting adequate fluid and a lot of things, oh, aches and that. pains, headaches, adequate fluid intake can really make a difference. So what do you do uh, to detect dehydration? Um, we're going to have a whole section I think okay, where we fine. talk about that. <laughs> All right. um, but I'll say in most cases it's the rule rather than the exception, dehydration. Yeah, okay. Okay. And because of that, we're going to be a little more careful in the type of medicines we use. Yeah. In uh, developed countries, we might use a lot of ibuprofen, um, we might use a lot of what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines or yeah. aspirin. Yeah. And someone who's dehydrated, you're running a lot more risks. So you really want to relegate, the, relegate those to second line and use more of your paracetamol. Um, and we'll have a chart for those of you watching with the different doses. But for the, for the younger individuals, they'll be weight-based. Um, and as you get to adults, um, you'll use higher doses. Um, but the distinction that we'll go back to that we first talked about is neuropathic pain does not respond particularly well to either one of those therapies. <laughs> and in many parts of the world, um, a medicine amitriptyline, usually started at low dose before bed, can make quite a difference. Wow. Do we have access to that drug in this country? <laughs> so we do. We do. We do. <laughs> yes. Am amitriptyline. I don't think I've ever heard that one. <laughs> I believe Elevil is the brand name. Oh, um, so maybe okay. you remember it from All that. Right. But yeah, <laughs> so I think we've I think we've gotten mostly through a pretty complicated subject here. Well, at least on um, a very on a very <clears throat> basic introductory level. You haven't covered eight through ten though, because eight through ten is really almost an intravenous clinical intervention strategy. Now that's perfect that you do that because that's that's something that I think we need to circle back to in every um, in every of our lectures that we do is there will be situations that are going to go beyond the means right. of a lot of um, at a lot of clinics. Yes. And we don't want to throw up our hands and say, well, we've done all we could do. Well, that's fine. We may have done all we could do, but there's certain levels of pain that really are medical emergencies and require, um, require opioids, require much exactly. stronger exactly. pain medications. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, this is one of the reasons I think people go into uh, medicine. They don't want people to suffer. Right. And this might be a situation, um, you can think of trauma, you can think of vehicle accidents, you can think of cancer, the list is quite long, um, where they'll have intense, severe, incapacitating pain, and our armamentarium of acetaminophen, of Aleve, of ibuprofen, of naproxen, are not going to really cover this. And you're going to need to either have the access to opioids, 
or have the ability to send someone to a facility that has that. So you and I have similar travel experiences for different reasons. Um, mostly mine are vacations and yours are mostly clinical intervention <laughs> strategies. <laughs> but we've both been to places where people who live at high altitude, mm -hmm. particularly Peru and Chile and, and the Himalayas, where maybe not so much in the Himalayas, but in, certainly in South America, they have access to coca leaves, mm -hmm. and they're using coca leaves to chew and to derive the cocaine from it to relieve the altitude sickness that is often experienced at altitudes above 18,000 feet, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are lots of uh, folk-oriented medicines which have as their um, modern equivalents mm -hmm. uh, the opioids that we currently use in mm -hmm let's say Western medicine. Uh, I'm often reminded of the stories that I was told when I was in school about the use of cocaine by farmers to relieve everyday pain at the end of a very, very difficult time during the summer months. And the derivative of that, which we now call Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. And it used to have cocaine actually in that fluid. Mm -hmm. And of course it's not there anymore, but the Coca part of Coca-Cola refers back to that origin. And yeah. that was a common drink back at the turn of the century. Yeah. No, many, many areas where people will practice, there'll be local remedies that might be plant-based. Exactly. And a lot of those are quite efficacious. Exactly. And exactly. a lot of times while you're there providing care, you might also yes. be learning about some of the remedies right. which have yet to be Correct. Uh, spread to other yes. areas. And aspirin is another one, but we won't go into that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining us again today. It's a pleasure. And we look forward to spending more time with you in the future. Yep.